Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the for the invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm quite happy that uh, my presentation comes right after Deborah's because I think that she covered uh, quite a bit of, uh, of issues that uh, helped in setting the stage for my presentation. Um, as uh, noted in the, um, in the agenda, I'll try to focus my presentation on looking at the value chain approach uh, to green growth, um, specifically looking at uh, a particular uh, sector that uh, RESP is working with quite a bit, which is uh, related to luxury goods industries of the cosmetics, uh, fashion, and jewelry. So with this, first, first of all, a very quick uh, introductory slide of what the responsible ecosystem sourcing platform is. So it is a, plat a multi-stakeholder platform uh, which was created in 2013. So as uh, with uh, the previous um, presentation with Deborah, we're still quite young. We're still quite developing a lot of the thinking and hopefully uh, starting uh, the real implementation of projects uh, in these coming months. Our main mission is actually very much uh, tied to the previous uh, presentation which is really to uh, focus on creating positive impacts uh, through uh, fostering change uh, with regards to the sustainable use of natural resources. And as I mentioned, uh, we do work uh, inter-industry inter with fashion, cosmetics, and jewelry, and they're key stakeholders within the value chain. And the reason that we do this is because uh, these three industries are highly dependent on natural resources for uh, their activities and uh, for their overall um, work. So in this sense, uh, what is uh, the formula that we are trying to uh, implement uh, with regards to the luxury goods industry? And why is this quite interesting, at least for us, with regards to promoting green and inclusive growth. So first of all, if we start uh, looking at this, uh, at this uh, illustration, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time in, in this slide. Uh, the first thing is that, uh, as everyone knows, we are looking at uh, both the production and the consumption impacts in order to really assess and to move forward with what we call green and inclusive growth. So uh, in starting with the production uh, part, we see that uh, in general, in general, the, the luxury goods industry uh, relies on a, a high value natural resources. As you know, these new natural resources uh, might have a specific uh, uh, limited availability. Um, they, in many cases, are very linked to native uh, or indigenous ecosystems. And thus, uh, this is the first part of the formula, being able to have high value natural resources to work with. In, with regards then to the second step, which is the consumption, we also see that in general terms, uh, luxury goods industry have a lower and, and thus a low to medium consumption levels especially in compared to uh, the mass market or the high street market, which uh, many times are driven by volumes and uh, low prices. So this is also, that provides us uh, an, additional, uh, an additional opportunity to be able to uh, start working with uh, lower consumption levels that will hopefully transform into an actual long-term uh, sustainable and uh, green and inclusive growth. Um, finally, with regards to added value, uh, there's also a significant level of value which is added uh, through the transformation processes of a uh, specific product. And thus, uh, we, we do see uh, relatively high margins between one parts uh, or one um, part of the, of the supply chain and the other. So what does this translate to with regards to the opportunities around the growth? Um, in looking at the high value natural resources, 
Uh, these not only provide uh, an important opportunity to use these resources sustainably, but also we uh, these resources can act as uh, reference uh, reference resources uh, that will enhance positive economic incentives for uh, conservation of uh, of nature in general. Uh, one of the most important things to bear in mind with regards to this is that, again, in many cases, and in looking at uh, the entire supply chain and the, the value chain, more specifically, you see that the green growth and inclusive growth has to happen not only in the initial parts of the value chain, which are more directly linked to the ecosystems and the biodiversity that was already uh, presented by Deborah in the, pre in the previous slide, but also need to tackle uh, important incentives uh, to be able uh, to carry forward uh, best practices uh, throughout the supply chain. So these high value natural resources provide the opportunity for these positive economic incentives to exist. In the case of the consumption, we also see that luxury goods industry in most cases are aspirational and to inspirational industries. Uh, especially in Asia, we see that uh, the growing uh, youth and the growing uh, population uh, many times aspires to uh, being able to own, uh, to uh, have uh, some of these luxury goods uh, products. So clearly in being able to demonstrate uh, through, again, facts and, uh, and, and indicators, uh, the potential positive impact that responsible uh, sourcing of uh, natural resources have, there is also an, imp uh, an important opportunity to influence behavior towards more sustainable lifestyles. And finally, adding the high margins, the aspirational, the high value added, then we do have a good opportunity to um, direct investments towards maintaining and increasing natural capital. And why? Because as I said in the very beginning, the three industries that RESP work with, works, works with um, fashion, cosmetics, and jewelry, are uh, clearly uh, industries that uh, rely quite highly on their natural resources and thus their risks and opportunities related to natural capital are very high. So with that, I'll really go very quickly to providing some very, some snapshots of examples that could uh, that we've seen, and uh, hopefully that can inform the discussion discussion afterwards. So one of the one of the examples is with regards to exotic skins, specifically reptiles. Uh, many people regard reptile skins as endangered species, which they are not. So they're regulated species by the uh, Convention on International Trade uh, of uh, Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Um, however, there is a really good opportunity with regards to managing uh, ecosystems, in this case, uh, freshwater ecosystems or forests, where these reptiles are found. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, added value opportunities related, and thus uh, this is where the economic, the inclusiveness of growth could come in. And again, we do have a strong international uh, framework for regulation, and thus it is quite important, uh, it, it does provide a framework to be able to advance with this growth in an orderly and regulated manner. Um, I guess in this, uh, in, in this example, uh, and as in the others, one of the main, uh, one of the main uh, challenges that we have uh, with regards to all this work around biodiversity and ecosystems is the indicators to measure it. And thus, uh, in this case, we are in RESP uh, looking quite a bit at uh, improving life cycle assessment uh, measurement indicators uh, to be able to more adequately uh, address the issue with regards to ecosystem level indicators. And this is something that uh, will be quite important with regards to the work that is being undertaken in Asia. Uh, very quickly, another example is with regards to the animal fibers. And here, for instance, uh, we, we all know um, some of the important issues that have been 
uh, ongoing with regards to the work in Mongolia around goats uh, related to grasslands and re related to also the strong added value potential that these have. Especially a lot of the work that's being undertaken around holistic management and where we see that the correct management of, uh, of these type of animals uh, that uh, function in herds could create a quite a positive impact with regards to re regeneration of grasslands. Um, again, I'm, 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 I'm whizzing through these examples very quickly, but in the, in the discussion, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, happy to provide more, more information as needed. Um, the third example is with regards to the natural ingredients for the cosmetics, and here clearly we see that there are quite a bit of opportunities with regards to uh, uh, translating some of the non-economic uh, or non-sustainable um, uh, or the less sustainable uh, activities around forests to more sustainable ones with regards to uh, wild cult cultivation or harvesting of natural ingredients for cosmetics uh, where there can be an added value being put forward uh, specifically with regards to the local communities such as distillation practices, for instance. And there's also a strong regulatory framework with regards to the trade uh, on these species, whether it's because of the sanitary or phytosanitary issues, or as in the case of reptiles, whether it's regulated because of uh, important species uh, that are uh, included within CITES. And finally, the last example with regards to the gems, and this is quite an interesting area because here is, uh, we're not looking at sustainable use of natural resources, but uh, most of all we're looking at the linkages of different industries working together in different uh, ecosystems. So in the case of colored gems, as many of you know, it is an industry which is mostly made up of artisanal and small-scale mining. That occurs in or around high biodiversity areas. So clearly here, without going too much into detail, there is a big opportunity of improving uh, management practices of, these, uh, of this sector and specifically improving restoration remediation um, practices after uh, uh, mines have closed and moved on. So again, I, I know that I really went through these slides quite quickly, but in, uh, given the, the time limitation, I hope that discussions will be able to uh, provide more information. So thank you all for having um, listened to this presentation.